Amplifying Voices from Development Perspectives and Field Fisher. Welcome to the second episode of our Amplifying Voices podcast series. In this episode, Flo will share with us the challenges of seeking asylum in a new country without knowledge of the language, its culture, or without a strong support network. She also shares about how she overcame some of these obstacles and tells us about the people who helped her along the way. So for our next podcast, we're delighted to be joined um, by, by Flo. Uh, Flo is going to share her, her very interesting story with us today. Flo, how are you? Did you have a, a nice weekend? Um, thank you, Paul. Yeah, I had a nice weekend. Thanks, God. Yeah, thank you. Hopefully you had a nice weekend, too. Yeah, yeah, very good. Very quiet, very quiet, which is uh, which was was needed. Um, I, su- I suppose getting started, Flo, um, you, with your story, um, maybe if you'd just like to like to start from the beginning, where does your story start? Yeah, um, actually, my story starts when me and my partner were uh, forced to flee our country and to come in Ireland to seek asylum in 2018. This is when our story begins and it begins right in the Dublin airport when we arrive and we immediately ask for asylum in the airport. And what were your first impressions when, when arriving in, in Dublin airport? What, what emotions did you have? Uh, how were you feeling? To be honest, thinking about that, because it's two, two and a half years <laughs> ago, but I remember perfectly, I felt fear uh, in, my, in my heart, in my being. I felt insecurity. Um, I didn't know what is gonna happen to me or to my partner. I didn't know what, what to expect. So you arrived in Dublin airport and sought asylum immediately. And, and what happened next? Next, uh, what happened is that they sent us to an office, which is called International Protection Office or IPO. When we were uh, supposed to tell the reasons why we came here in Ireland and why we are asking for asylum. And then suddenly after doing this uh, first interview, they send us in a BNB and we stayed there for two years in that BNB, which is called emergency accommodation. Wow, and so so two years um, in the in the BNB, and what what was the uh... What was the B&B like? Um, what, was there many people around you that, that could provide support to you? And, and yeah, what was the su- support structure like for you? Uh, well, Paul, actually in the beginning, uh, we didn't know anyone in this country. We did not have any family or any friend or any known person uh, which could offer us at least emotional support. Um, when we first arrived at BNB, actually, uh, I did not know how much we're going to stay there. So I remember myself, I asked the manager, uh, how, how much are we going to stay here? And I remember she said, for at least three months. And I looked at my partner and I, I was so happy because I knew it at least that for three months, we're gonna be safe away, away from our country because I was constantly in fear that maybe they will turn us back. And when she said three months, it was a lot of time to be saved. So I felt happy about that. There were a lot of people, about 30 other people, three zero and it was very hard to live in a BMV with 30 other people and using the same washing machine. We had just one washing machine, just one kitchen. Everything was just one. And you have to share between 30 other people. 
obviously a very challenging situation to to arrive and, and not know people and um, have such uncertainty uh, hanging over hanging over yourself and your partner. Um, in terms of in terms of your first few months, um, was there any other was there any other challenges? Um, you know, practical challenges. Of course, you've mentioned some challenges about, you know, um, you know, sharing a small amount of of utilities with with a, a large group of people. But was there any other challenges that uh, that you faced? Yes, a lot of challenges. I would say my English was very little, so it was a barrier for me for everything. We were situated in the middle of nowhere where there was no bus station, uh, no institutions or groups when I can uh, participate or integrate myself. Um, we had no the right to work, so we cannot also ask for, you know, <laughs> To work because work in itself is a way of integrating yourself you know and um, there was a lack of transport obviously being an asylum seeker you are not allowed to drive and being in a remote area where you are surrounded by <laughs> let's say by trees trees are beautiful but i mean in the sense of um, integrating yourself it was very hard because you don't have the right to drive, you don't have the right to work for nine months, you are limited and you are forced to live in that institution to follow those rules, which are very damaging for, for people who live there. Absolutely. And with this huge wealth of challenges that you had to face, were you able to overcome any of them? And if so, how did you receive some help from people? Well, uh, obviously, when you are in a situation like this, the first instincts are, OK, I have to go out of this. Uh, I cannot stay like this. You can stay for one month, two months, three months, if you if you are very patient, four months, you know, but uh, not for two years, you know, you have to do something. And what me and my part partner did, we start to participate in, uh, in an English class that was in the town. Obviously we had, uh, we need transport the transport uh, was coming once a day just once a day uh, it was arranged after three months we, st we stood there and we both started to go to the english classes and this was the first step once uh, we start to learn English, then it was everything more easy. We started to go to the church and there we uh, started to know new people. Uh, the priest of the parish would come sometime to visit us. He was the first friend we had actually, the first real friend who tried to help us. And after I get birth to my daughter, Olivia, um the public nurse was coming to visit me and she became a friend to me <laughs> and also she suggested me some um, other organizations where i can participate one of them is life start organization i don't know if I, I can mention it but the person who was visiting me from this organization was so helpful being a new mother for the first time you you are already full of secure insecurities but these people helped me a lot to overcome all these insecurities that I had. Uh, the teacher for the English class helped me a lot. And step by step, I was creating this little circle of people that I know and I know that I can trust them. The first key step really was that English class. And obviously that had many, many effects in terms of learning the language, which I, I must say your English is, is uh, very, very good. Um, and and that spilled over into other areas of life. So with, with church, and then of course with with um, have having your your baby and and you know be, becoming friends with the nurse who came out to you. Do do you think that um, language uh, uh, language was probably that biggest challenge then initially, and by learning the language that that many other things fell into place for you. <laughs> Yes, the language was a big barrier for me, but starting to improve the English opened me so many doors. Thanks to the fact 
that I learned English. I also started an online uh, class about um, healthcare. And I finished a course which is called QQI Level 5 in Healthcare. And if I did not know English, it would be very, very hard to finish the course. It's very clear how learning the language just leads into so many other positive outcomes and leads to further ed education opportunities. So you spent two years in, in the B&B, &B, uh, if, if I remember correctly. What yes. happened after the two years? Um, what were the circumstances where you moved from the B&B? &B? Unfortunately, it was becoming very hard to live in the B&B for so long, especially when you have a small child to look after. And we had just one small room, me, my husband and my baby. And we had to cook by turns. So in specific time, once in two weeks, I had to wash my clothes. So I needed to wash more because I have a baby. You know, there were some certain rules that really were making my life uh, miserable and we asked for transfer from the institution who was um, responsible to move asylum seekers from one accommodation to another and finally after trying so much and so many times they uh, they moved us they moved us to another center which was three hours away from the bnb and when the transfer came uh, I was hoping that uh, it's going to be another, maybe another room, but in another uh, place, in another county. Boy, but when we came boy. here, I was so surprised that I found that it was a, like a, a, a cabin, you know, a mini, like a mini apartment when you have um, the basic, basic things like your washing machine, a little kitchen, fridge and um, your own bed you know and i was extremely happy because for for two years i was living in that small room when i was not even allowed to eat in that room because uh, the management would say oh you attract mice and so you were forced to eat just the three meals and you cannot eat or do any personal thing in your in your room, like keeping a heater maybe or a small fridge. You moved from uh, maybe more a more restrictive environment to an environment <laughs> with with a little less regulations and, and rules, and and this helped with with um, raising uh, um, raising your newborn baby and just having a little bit more um, flexibility to do some of the the basic things like cook and 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 wash clothes and, and all of this kind of thing. Um, yes, are very important for a woman. Maybe it looks like uh, not very important thing, but it's a very important thing for a mom to have these basic things, you sure. know, opportunity, you know. Well, well I, I guess it's the point also that maybe there's some things that, that um, <laughs> that we take we can take for granted sometimes that may not have been the case in in the b&b &B that you stayed in and um, but yeah. seems to be a little bit more flexibility and is it are you currently still in this um uh, accommodation uh yes i'm still in this accommodation unfortunately i did not receive my status yet because you are going to be an asylum seeker for is supposed to be for a temporary time so while you are while they are processing your case uh, you you should stay in in a direct provision this is a direct provision the other one was emergency accommodation you've obviously moved to um the new accommodation and of course there was positives to that that you've mentioned and um, but obviously the new challenge then of of making new friends, meeting new people, um, learning about the, the, the surrounds of, of um, where you've moved to. Um, how, how, how have you managed that? Has, has it, have you been able to do this? Have you been able to meet new people and make new connections? Uh, well, Paul, actually, when we moved here, it was the peak of the pandemic. Uh, so we moved here about six months ago because we have two years and a half in Ireland in total. And um, everything was closed, you know? Uh, all the groups, everything actually was closed. So nowhere when you can participate, only thing was social media. 
and yeah it was hard but thanks god i received my qqi level uh, cert they sent it to me and so i was able to apply for works uh, for jobs like uh, as a healthcare and since it was the peak of pandemic everyone was desperate to have healthcare workers and i was very lucky that i was uh, contacted by a nursing home here in Gal uh, here when i live and um so they contacted me, I did my interview, and I started working as a healthcare in a nursing home. Uh, it was totally a new experience for me because we were dealing with a very hard and difficult situation. People were infected with the virus and, you know, it was so pleasure for me that I was contributing during the pandemic and um, working with, uh, with the patients, but, at the same time, it was one of um, the most sad <laughs> job that I, I had ever done because it, it started in, in the middle of the pandemic. So, yeah, and there in the job uh, what I, that I was doing, obviously, I, I met other people and I made friends and not everyone knew my story. Like, I would not go there and say, oh, hello, I'm an asylum seeker, obviously. I don't want people to know me for being an asylum seeker. I want them to know me for who I am and what I can do. And yeah, this was the only friend resource, let, let's say like this, a, a place when I can make friends, the sure. only one. And and I, I think what you said there is, is really powerful, um, Flo, um, in terms of how you identify yourself. You don't identify yourself as an asylum seeker you identify yourself as flow and and that's the person who you want people to know and yeah no very 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 powerful and um the 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 pandemic of course um affected everyone no doubt but again we can see how uh in your circumstances moving to a, a new area in the middle of the pandemic again can can bring up challenges um that that maybe um other other people don't have to face uh, um, themselves, you know. So, I I, I suppose um, listening to the the perseverance you've shown, the the resilience you you you've had, um, the 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 and the action that you've taken um, uh, over the last number of years. Uh, looking to the future and um, what are your hopes and, and 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 dreams for the future i suppose um my dreams um i don't know where to start because i have a lot of dreams but i will tell what are my immediate <laughs> immediate dreams um i please god that very soon uh, we're gonna have our status and we will not be an, uh, like asylum seekers forever i mean so and once you have your status, you have a lot of rights. You have the right to drive, you have the right to work without being um, like forced to renew this work permit every uh, six months. I think now is uh, every year, I'm not sure. And uh, yeah, this is the biggest dream at the moment. So I can get out of this system, you know, because when you live in a system like this, you are institutionalized and uh, no institution, person or government should limit the opportunities for people. You know, when you are living in their provision, it means you are limited. You don't have equal opportunities like others have. And I understand this is a process, but when the process takes too long, it's very, very damaging. So I hope I will have my status very soon and we can get out of that provision then. Uh, my dream is also um, to finish my, I'm going to start a, a course on September. Uh, so about education and in the same time, I'm also engaged uh, volunteering in helping women in direct provision i have a group of 31 women here when i leave and i am in contact with some charities and 
I always tell them, okay, I have this group of women living here. Some are single moms, uh, some are ill, some are old, and they need a lot of support and maybe sometimes even material things. So I, I, I go and ask for them. This is what I do. Wow, and 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 I mean I mean to have the, the, the strength to to not only um to not only have have uh, walked towards improving your own situation in the last number of years since you arrived, but also helping others as well. I mean, um yeah, that that's just that, that's amazing. Um that's amazing. So so keep up the good work on that side, I would say. Um what one one last question I, I would have, and I suppose for for our listeners, um, for you, what what's the what's the message? Um, what's the lesson uh, you would like people to to take from from your story? Um, you know that 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 maybe they can they can apply in some way to their own their own lives. Uh, I want I want to say that everyone in life will be in a, a difficult situation once or twice. <laughs> it depends, and this is this was my and is still my difficult situation in life. Living in that provision emergency accommodation is the biggest difficult thing that I I experienced in long term. Um, what I want people to know is that um, asylum seekers, they are not uh, here because they want to, but because they are forced to. Uh, so many people, they compare us and say, oh, you, you have to be grateful, you have to be grateful because there are people on the street. And this is, uh, this is something that I understand, but we are very grateful. And all we want is that people to know that we are not just asylum seekers. We are more than that. We have our own philosophy of life. We have our own culture, um, our own contributions to make. Um, I suppose everyone has uh, a lot of contributions contribution to give to society or to the place where they live, to their friends or to their family. So let's try to help people that we have near. I know that connects a lot with, with our work and development uh, perspectives in terms of being the change uh, you want to see in the world. And I mean, I, 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 certainly, um, I certainly think that uh, in, in your time in Ireland so far, you, you've done so much to contribute, not only um, to, to you and your family's um, uh, situation, but, but the situation of, of many other people as well. And we've gotten to know you, um, of course, uh, over this process. And it's just a, it's an amazing story. And, and we're, we're very lucky to, to have you sharing it um, on our podcast. Um, so, so think, sure, please me i thank you for that um, people don't want to listen i say this very often people tend to be more open for positive stuff to listen and they want to be positive and want to listen positive things but the reality is what it is independently what we want to hear so sometimes um we have to be open to listen also difficult stories and difficult situation happening. Sure. Yeah. And, and just because if we're not open to listen and we, we don't hear it, it doesn't mean that it's not the reality sometimes um, for, for sure. But we, I would like to thank you on, on behalf of, of, of um, the Amplifying Voices podcast and development perspectives um, for your openness, your your honesty and, and your courage in telling your story. And then um, I just hope that that people listening can can take some some inspiration from it, because uh, I know I certainly um, uh, will. So, Flo, thank you very, very much. Um, yeah, and, and that was great. Thank you for having me, Paul. Thank you for giving me the chance to, to express myself. And 
Um, thank you for being there to listen. Uh, this is very, very important for me. Thank you for listening. On our next podcast, Daniela will share with us her unique challenges associated with raising a child with autism under the circumstances of fleeing Syria during the ongoing conflict. See you at the next time. Amplifying voices from development perspectives and field fisher. <laughs>